Hello, I'm Alyssa Weaver, and I'm going to tell you about biogenesis and intracellular transfer of extracellular RNA via extracellular vesicles. Extracellular RNA is secreted in the form of both extracellular vesicles, small and large, and non-vesicular particles. We think of two major classes of extracellular vesicles, exosomes, which are small vesicles, which come from endosomes, and microvesicles, which are formed by budding of the plasma membrane. Extracellular RNA carried by extracellular vesicles are involved in a variety of types of intercellular communication, autocrine, paracrine, and endocrine, and it has a vast impact on physiology and pathogenicity. There's also a lot of interest in extracellular vesicle delivery of RNA as a therapeutic delivery system. This mechanism is naturally exploited by a number of different cell types, including cancer cells. And uh, a variety of studies have shown that RNA delivered by EVs enhances tumor genesis, metastasis, and drug resistance. So why would an RNA need to be delivered via an extracellular vesicle? The benefits of cargo delivery in this way are A, they're actively delivered, secreted from cells, so it's an active process. The vesicle protects the RNA from digestion in the extracellular space because it's on the inside of the vesicle, and there are multiple modes of targeted uptake by recipient cells. So once the vesicle fuses with a recipient cell, it can deliver the RNA to the cytoplasm of that cell. So as I mentioned, there are two major classes of extracellular vesicles that we typically talk about. One is exosomes, which are small vesicles that are formed within endosomes. This happens by inward budding to form multivesicular bodies. And those multivesicular bodies, once fused, will fuse with the plasma membrane to release those internal vesicles. And that's what we call exosomes. They're generally between 30 and 200 nanometers in size. Microvesicles instead are shed from the plasma membrane. There are some very small vesicles, as small as 100 nanometers, that are shed, but by and large, the large vesicles are shed from the plasma membrane. Microvesicle biogenesis involves a combination of cytoskeletal and lipid remodeling. Cortical actin weakness can lead to blebbing of the plasma membrane. And that combined with contractility of the actin cytoskeleton via myosins can lead to pinching off of those vesicles to help them release. There's also lipid remodeling that takes place in some cases involving flipping of lipids from one membrane to another via lipid flippases. Other biophysical mechanisms involve hyaluronin production to help pinching of little vesicles at the end of protrusions that cells make, microvilli or phyllopodia. And then the smaller vesicles, exosomes, or the small vesicles that are formed within endosomes, rather, that's what we call exosomes. The machinery for that is better understood, actually, than that of microvesicles, although we are still trying to understand biogenesis of exosomes as well. But basically, cargoes are either coming from the plasma membrane, like transmembrane cargos or membrane-linked cargos, and then sorted into these interluminal vesicles, or cargos can come from the cytoplasm. So RNAs are actually in that category. They're coming from the cytoplasm. And then once a multivesicular uh, body is formed, it has several possible fates. It can either fuse with lysosomes and be degraded, either directly or via autophagosomes, or they can dock and fuse with the plasma membrane to allow release of the interluminal vesicles as exosomes. A number of proteomic studies have been done for both small and large extracellular vesicles, exosomes and microvesicles. Exosome cargos can reveal clues about how exosomes form and function. For example, although tetraspanins can be found on the small vesicles also that bud from the plasma membrane, exosomes also are highly enriched in tetraspanins, especially CD63 is a good marker for exosomes. They're also enriched in adhesion molecules and certain kinds of lipids, often those found in lipid rafts, such as cholesterol, ceramides, and sphingomyelins. Exosomes have also been found to be involved in antigen presentation, so they have MHC molecules. And there are a number of signaling receptors, such as epidermal growth factor receptor, TNF receptor, etc. Some of the mechanisms of exosome biogenesis, 
and release. They're depicted here. Cargos can be recognized and loaded in a few different ways. The best understood are proteins that are recognized by the escort machinery, escort bind to ubiquitinated proteins, such as epidermal growth factor, and recruit the rest of the escort machinery to then pull that cargo into a interluminal vesicle and the rest of the escort machinery helps make that bud inside, make that interluminal vesicle. Tetraspanins form membrane-enriched domains of signaling proteins and may pull cargos along with the whole domain. RNAs are often associated with RNA binding proteins. In terms of the budding of the vesicle, the escort machinery can help induce inward membrane budding. And then a second mechanism besides the escort machinery that's been described is formation of ceramide, which is a lipid with asymmetrical properties that helps induce membrane curvature to help the membranes bud. Once a multivesicular body is formed, it can be docked at the plasma membrane. RAB27 is one of the known docking proteins. The actin cytoskeletal machinery is also involved in docking. And then snare proteins are also known to mediate MVB docking with the plasma membrane to release exosomes. As I alluded to in the previous slide, different cargos may use distinct molecular loading mechanisms. Ubiquitinated proteins are known to be captured by the escort machinery, whereas other types of cargos may depend on tetraspanin or ceramide-dependent mechanisms. It's been less clear how cytoplasmic cargos actually associate with endosomal membranes to be incorporated into an extracellular vesicle. In this case, we're showing an RNA binding protein, HNRP, A2B1, sorting of particular RNA, but how those associate with the membrane is not so clear. RNAs, because this is a talk about extracellular RNA, are released from cells in diverse formats. As I mentioned, they can be released in different kinds of extracellular vesicles. The inside of an extracellular vesicle is like the inside of a cell, and the outside is like the outside of a cell in terms of what proteins and molecules are found in different places. There are also non-vesicular RNA binding protein complexes that are found outside the cell. It's not really clear how they get there, whether there's an active release mechanism or whether those are just released when cells die and some of the intracellular contents end up in the extracellular milieu. In the bloodstream, it's also known that RNAs can associate with lipoproteins such as HDL. So RNA is present in the extracellular environment in a variety of forms. Now, one of the things that we understand best about extracellular RNA trafficking into extracellular vesicles is that this seems to happen in complex with RNA binding proteins. There are a number of cases where RNA binding proteins have been found to transport specific RNAs, and that this involves recognition of specific RNA sequence motifs. One of the first examples was HNRP A2B1 transporting RNAs that had some specific motifs, but there are others listed here. Now, these motifs are not universal. There are different RNA motifs for the same protein, so degenerate sequences, and there are also different motifs for different proteins. So while in the beginning we thought we might find a universal zip code, it seems that it's not as simple as that, the code for how RNAs get recognized by RNA binding proteins and trafficked into vesicles. There's also the issue of subcellular location. RNA and RNA binding protein complexes may be all over the cell, but how do they actually associate with the membranes to get into an extracellular vesicle? This example here in this slide is from a paper where they studied selective loading of microRNAs by the RNA binding protein FMR1. This involved a mechanism where a protein RILP, which is associated with late endosomes, bound to FMR1, which is an RNA binding protein, as well as to HRS, which is an escort protein, and promoted multivesicular body movement to the cell periphery. It associated with microRNA 
and then was packaged into exosomes. So there's trafficking and specific molecular association is important. A recent paper in eLife found that RNA binding protein granules may be a source of RNA, where a number of granules throughout the cell that contain RNAs. In particular, the group was studying a YBX1 protein that they had found transports certain microRNAs into extracellular vesicles. And they found that the ability of this YBX1 to condense into RNA granules was important for its ability to also sort microRNAs into exosomes. Another example where the cellular machinery and organelle association was important for loading RNAs into exosomes was a study from Jay Debnev's laboratory on the autophagy-related protein LC3. What the authors found there was that LC3, once it is lipidated, can have a function that's actually separate from its function in forming autophagosomes. It can, in addition, be involved in the formation of extracellular vesicles. And those extracellular vesicles were enriched for a subset of snow RNAs and microRNAs. And this involved activation of ceramide formation and intraluminal budding of multivesicular bodies. Intracellular trafficking was also found to be important for a transport of microRNAs into microvesicles. This is work from Chris Lynn D'Souza Shorey's laboratory, where they found that R6 mediated RAN gap phosphorylation was involved in transport of microRNAs to microvesicles. Specifically, they found that the nuclear transport proteins exporting 5 and RAN GTP transported pre microRNA into the cytoplasm. There, the RAN gap was phosphorylated downstream of R6, and then this RAN gap hydrolyzed the GTP of RAN GTP, and this then released the complex and the exporting 5, GRP1, and R6 mediated the pre microRNA loading into tumor microvesicles. Interestingly, the pre-microRNA complex also included Dicer and Argonaut 2, which are members of the microRNA processing machinery that would mediate processing of a pre-microRNA to mature microRNA so that it could mediate downstream functions. Another line of research involves how the RNA binding proteins are able to load RNA into extracellular vesicles with respect to post-translational modification. For HNRNPA 2 b one this has been found to involve a couple of post-translational mo modifications. The first one is sumoylation, which induces microRNA loading into exosomes. In addition, oglycnacylation of the same protein can modulate microRNA loading into microvesicles. This mechanism occurs downstream of oxidative stress, which induces nuclear export of the RNA binding protein in interaction with phosphorylated caviolin 1. And then the phosphocaviolin 1 and HNRPA2B1 traffic together to the cell periphery, where the oglycnacylation of the RNA binding protein occurs. And that allows it to bind a microRNA, and the whole complex is delivered to sites of microvesicle budding. My laboratory found another case of post translational modification, in this case of Argonaut 2, which is a critical member of the RNA silencing machinery. Phosphorylation of AGO2 downstream of KRAS actually inhibits AGO2 and microRNA sorting to exosomes. Our model is on the left here, where KRAS activation of MEC and ERK on late endosomes inhibits argonaut microRNA incorporation into multivesicular bodies. Instead, they're sorted to processing bodies. Now, there are other AGO2 independent microRNA sorting mechanisms that occur in cells with mutant KRAS, but this definitely affects the microRNA repertoire. These are some of the data where we found that there was an increase in phospho-AGO2 with mutant to KRAS cells compared to wild type cells, and this phosphorylation was inhibited by MEK and AKT inhibitors. If we express a non phosphorylatable AGO2 in KRAS mutant cells, we find that there's an increase 
in IGO2 localization to multivesicular bodies, which has not happened under the wild type situation or with the phosphomimetic IGO2. This is paralleled by export of AGO2 into exosomes quantified in the graph and also paralleled by effects on specific candidate microRNAs in exosomes that are sorted with the non-phosphorylatable mutant. Also, if we knock down AGO2 in wild type cells, then we find an effect on sorting of small RNAs and specific microRNAs into exosomes. Based on that work, we were interested in how the Argonaut 2 was being trafficked and associated with the multivesicular bodies. And one of the things that we noticed was that risk components of the RNA silencing machinery and RNA granules are often associated with the endoplasmic reticulum. The cartoon on the left illustrates some of the known literature that the nucleation of the RNA silencing machinery beginning with Argonaut 2 occurs on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then multivesicular bodies are the probable sites of risk recycling. In addition, other RNA granules are known to associate with the endoplasmic reticulum or other RNA complexes, I should say. This is just one example where the RNA binding protein TIS11B forms membraneless RNA granules intertwined with the endoplasmic reticulum. In order to look at that, we inhibited contact between the endoplasmic reticulum and membrane contact sites via the protein VAP-A and found microRNAs were decreased in both small and large EVs in VAP-A knockdown cells, but not in the wild-type cells. Those were all examples of mechanisms that are known to transport extracellular RNA into extracellular vesicles and mediate the biogenesis of those vesicles. There's a lot more to be done in that area, but I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about how extracellular vesicles deliver RNA species to recipient cells. Just to take a step back, why is it important to understand the extracellular RNA content of extracellular vesicles? Well, it affects the cell and tissue function in both health and disease. It may inform biomarker studies, and it's critical if you want to understand how to engineer vesicles that are carrying therapeutic RNAs. Another question that's come up is what is the magnitude of the extracellular content in EVs? Really, how much RNA is there? Actually, often there's very little. If you take a bulk population of extracellular vesicles, on average, the vesicles contain less than one copy of any given RNA. However, it is likely that only a small subpopulation of those extracellular vesicles actually contain RNA, and those vesicles will be much more concentrated. But obviously, the impact on recipient cells driven through the release requires a sufficient amount of RNA per EV. Another thing I want to mention relevant to delivery to recipient cells is that small EVs, which are an exosome-enriched population, have distinct transcriptomes compared to large EVs, which are a microvesicle enriched population. And both of those populations are different from the cellular transcriptome. Small EVs have more yRNA, more small non-coding RNA, and more microRNAs relative to large EVs. They also have only very short full-length mRNAs and fragments of longer mRNAs. By contrast, full-length mRNAs that are larger than 1 kb are found only in large EVs, by and large. And then there's a variability, obviously, for the RNA content, depending on the donor cell type and the physiological state. Extracellular RNA released from EVs will perform diverse functions in recipient cells. This is from a very wonderful review from Sandra Brakefield's laboratory. It just illustrates some of the things that I mentioned, that extracellular vesicles really have a variety of RNA cargos with different functions. Some of those RNAs have known functions. Some of them have unknown functions, completely unknown. And some of them have predicted functions. Parsing that complexity is really a challenge for the field. There's also very heterogeneous vesicle content. Many of those vesicles may not contain any RNA. And then depending on 
which recipient cells are able to take up those vesicles and have the appropriate transcriptome or other milieu inside to respond to what's delivered, you may get a very different effect. Extracellular vesicles can be taken up by recipient cells in a variety of ways. Many of those ways involve endocytosis, and in fact, often labeled extracellular vesicles can be seen to go primarily to endosomes. And pretty much any kind of endocytosis that has been described has seen that EVs can take that route inside of cells. So it is likely that many times the vesicles are fusing with endosomal membranes to deliver RNA cargoes to the cytoplasm of recipient cells. Once that delivery has happened, the microRNA, as an example, can regulate mRNA translation, degradation, and transcriptional activity. There are a variety of ways that people have used to report out the effect of delivered RNA, especially microRNA. We really don't understand very well how to assay for delivery of other kinds of RNA. An example from our extracellular RNA group at Vanderbilt of how to assay for microRNAs is shown in this graph here. This is a proof of concept where luciferase activity in recipient cells is inhibited by microRNA 100 delivered from donor cells. In this case, luciferase reporters were designed. The idea is that the luciferase either has sites for microRNA 100 or control sites. If there's microRNA 100 that's delivered, then it will bind to the luciferase RNA and prevent it from being translated. And this will lead to a loss of luciferase activity. So you can see here with a no donor, there's a certain level of luciferase activity for the MIR 100 reporter, which is actually less than the control reporter, probably because there's some MIR 100 in the recipient cells already. And then this is inhibited further in the presence of the DKO1 donor. This inhibition is reversed if there's an antagonist, an antagomir to the MIR-100 that was given to the donor cell. So this is one way to prove that there's actually microRNA being transferred from a donor cell to a recipient cell is to inhibit it in the donor cell and reverse the effect in the recipient cell. What about pathophysiological functions of microRNAs that have been reported? There are a number that have been reported, some in cancer to other cells in the microenvironment, also some examples from the cardiac system and from adipose macrophages, mesenchymal stem cells, and adipocytes themselves. You'll notice that often the recipient cells are a different cell type, and then there are a variety of functional effects that have been reported, including effects on angiogenesis, inhibition of fibrosis and apoptosis, alterations in insulin resistance, and alterations in bone regeneration. There are a number of future challenges. This is a very young area, but one is to understand better the rules of microRNA delivery and action. We don't understand in a very quantitative way how much of the RNA is delivered and how many microRNAs need to be delivered to cause a certain effect, and also which EVs will fuse with which cells and be able to deliver RNAs. Another thing that we don't understand really is what is the effects of other types of RNA. MicroRNAs have been heavily studied because they have clear consequences and are clearly important in many different phenotypes, but there are many other types of RNA that are delivered by EVs that could also have important functions. I want to make one last comment about this area, studying the biogenesis and the delivery of RNA via extracellular vesicles is challenging for a number of reasons and requires careful consideration and rigorous processes. One consideration, it seems obvious, but is not always so obvious, is that the cell state will necessarily affect the EV cargo content. If you have cells in vitro, the cell state will often be affected by cell culture conditions. Cell type will also affect the EV cargo content. In addition, your ability to assay for that cargo content may be altered by contaminants. 
Another thing that is a challenge is that low RNA copy number, RNA modifications, and heterogeneity of extracellular vesicles can complicate RNA profiling. Another consideration is that extracellular vesicles can be difficult to separate from serum contaminants. There are a lot of things in serum, which is a common cell culture additive, including very large amounts of non-vesicular RNA, lipoproteins, and protein aggregates. These can be very difficult to remove from extracellular vesicles. So the best thing to do really is to avoid the use of serum in cell culture. It's also desirable to use density gradient or other high resolution methods to remove contaminants. RNAs may also be required to either remove RNAs or to determine whether the RNAs are present mostly on the outside or the inside of the extracellular vesicles. In addition, the small size of extracellular vesicles requires high resolution methods of imaging and characterization. For example, assays such as nanoparticle tracking, tunable resistance, pulse sensitivity, electron microscopy, these are all methods to help characterize the vesicles. To summarize what I've talked about in this lecture, RNA packaging into extracellular vesicles enables autocrine, paracrine, and endocrine effects on physiology. Extracellular vesicles contain a wide variety of RNA species. Extracellular vesicle biogenesis involves multiple mechanisms of cargo recruitment and membrane curvature induction. EV RNA content is regulated by post-translational modifications of RNA binding proteins and other effectors. Also, multiple pathways of EV uptake may allow access of extracellular RNA to recipient cells. A number of pathophysiological effects of microRNA have been documented for cardiac disease, cancer, diabetes, and other diseases. And a greater understanding of EV biology and extracellular RNA transport will require continuing standardization of methods, optimization of methods, and innovative new approaches. Major ongoing questions in the field of extracellular vesicle-mediated extracellular RNA transport include some that I touched on today. How are RNAs and RNA binding proteins targeted to the secretory machinery for inclusion in extracellular vesicles? Are different pathways used for packaging RNA and other cytoplasmic cargos versus membrane-linked proteins into extracellular vesicles? Finally, a big area is what is the extent of the functional response to RNA uptake by recipient cells? We really don't understand how efficient the fusion of RNA containing EVs with recipient cells is. We know very little about the molecular mechanisms that control functional RNA delivery. And we know almost nothing about the impact of RNAs other than microRNAs. I would like to acknowledge the extracellular RNA group at Vanderbilt. We were first funded by the Extracellular RNA Communication Consortium and now by a program project grant on this topic. I'd also like to thank my laboratory, particularly Renee Dawson, who helped me prepare these slides, and Anashika Barman, who did some of the work that I presented today. I'd also like to acknowledge the Vanderbilt Center for Extracellular Vesicle Research. And thank you for your attention.